Hey, deserving listeners, I thought I would answer some patron emails here. There were some other emails about dependent personality disorder that I thought I would review. So it's kind of a follow-up to the follow-up from last week. Patron Becky from Canada wrote in and said, Thank you for doing that series on dependent personality disorder. I deal with social anxiety and depression, but this kind of completes the picture for me. My core beliefs are that I'm not important, I am a child and others will see that, and I am incompetent, even though I'm a 34-year-old adult with a job and a relationship. I had an overprotective mom. My parents fought a lot. My dad got drunk on weekends and was verbally abusive to my mother. I was very shy and people-pleasing to my mom to make up for the abuse that she was going through. I've been to therapists off and on, but no one has ever mentioned any kind of diagnosis that I know of much less dependent personality disorder. Is this something that is becoming more well-known? End of email. Well, uh, patron Becky from Canada, what I will say is that, no, uh, uh, dependent personality disorder is not very well-known, as evidenced by the fact that a lot of therapists still use the term codependency, which, of course, if you listen to my uh, deep dive on dependent personality disorder, you will understand that that is an incorrect, often an incorrect usage of the term. And also, personality disorders in general are uh, not very well known, so uh, let alone dependent personality disorder specifically. Why is that? Well, it's because one, as I always say, personality disorders are very complicated. It takes a lot of training and a lot of experience and a lot of supervision to understand any one of them. You cannot understand these things by just reading a book or looking at the symptoms or watching a, you know, a video of something. You have to experience these people firsthand, either as clients or even in your personal life. And you have to be very, um, I don't know, educated on psychology and personality disorders and personality. And, you know, it's, it's pretty complicated. So, uh, you know, you're asking Becky, well, you know, none of my therapy, I've been in therapists off and on and I've you know, I, I have these issues and I've talked about them, but no one ever talked about dependent personality disorder. So one, it's possible that they did diagnose you with dependent personality disorder, either in, you know, uh, officially or unofficially, m- meaning that they had a accurate conceptualization of you um, as someone with dependent personality. I don't know if you had dependent personality disorder, but if you did, then um, there's this possibility that they, that they did accurately conceptualize you, but just didn't mention it. It's also, I think, equally as possible that they just had no idea what uh, dependent personality disorder was. Now, do you need to understand dependent personality disorder in order to treat what might be observed in you? No. I mean, if, if you came to someone and, and presented a schema that you're not important, it doesn't take a genius therapist to know that correcting for that is important cognitively and healing-wise. Um, the other thing that... Uh, factors into why a lot of therapists don't understand dependent personality disorder is that there's very little training, if any at all. It's not uncommon for even doctoral level clinicians to have received essentially no training on dependent personality disorder. They probably at some point talked about borderline personality disorder because that is very popular disorder that uh, among the personality disorders when people are talking about things. Dependent personality disorder is something that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, I, I have two master's degree and a doctorate degree. I don't, I, don't can't, I can't remember a single time that any professor brought it up or it was a part of an assignment or something. So that might sound kind of weird, right? That you will have training programs and you will graduate and you will have a license in psychology or marriage or family therapy or counseling or social work or whatever, or even psychiatry. And You've literally never had a professor say, let's talk about dependent personality disorder. And even if they did, it was probably very brief amongst all the other personality disorders. When I got my master's and I took psychopathology, we spent, I believe, one week on the personality disorders. And that's all nine of them in one week. So how could you possibly fully or even barely understand dependent personality disorder based on that training uh, routine. So so it's a problem. And we need more talk along these lines. There needs to be more robust training. There needs to be more post-grad certification along these lines. Because 
you'll have dependent personality disorder and then you'll go to a therapist and it's not guaranteed that they even know what dependent personality disorder is. So, you know, it's a problem for sure. Now, you talk about how you have some pretty classic childhood factors. You had an overprotective parent, possibly anxious parent. There was some chaos and some abuse that you witnessed. And you also you also had enmeshment with your parent, meaning that your mom was very much over-involved in your life, not a lot of healthy age-appropriate boundaries, and that you abs- uh, absorbed that anxiety and that responsibility for pleasing your mom to make up for the abuse that she was going through. You knew too much about her emotional state, and thus uh, that is the breeding ground for a lot of things, including dependent personality disorder. You also have the classic schemas of dependent personality disorder. I am not important. I am a child, and others will see that, and I am incompetent. Um, And you have some of the classic results, depression, anxiety, people-pleasing, negative self-talk. So the key is, is continue going to therapy. And even though your therapist might not understand dependent personality disorder, they will understand the schemas that you have. It's not hard to understand. If you say, by the way, I suffer from this ongoing distorted notion in my head that I'm not important, that I am a child, and that I am incompetent when I, I don't know if that's exactly accurate because I feel like I am competent. And I feel like I've been playing that out with you being my therapist that I've been looking to you to tell me what to do because I inherently believe I don't know what to do. But on the inside, I kind of just want someone to believe in me that I am capable of doing these things, you know? So you can absolutely talk with a therapist in that way. And, you know, they should be able to understand that even if they don't understand personality disorders very well. All right. This next email is from anonymous patron. They write, After listening to your deep dives about dependent personality disorder, I am strongly reminded of my brother. He is an extremely sweet and smart person. He's successful at his job, but he sees himself as only a child in a world of adults. He finds himself in relationships where he is taken advantage of by others, and he has no boundaries with these people. I am often sucked into wanting to save him. He depends on me a lot. I can get extremely frustrated with him at the clear injustices that happen in his in his life. When he is not in a relationship, he no longer takes care of himself. He hardly eats, he doesn't clean after himself or bathe, and he gets out of work as much as possible until the next person comes along to take care of him and tell him what to do. I have recommended therapy and have set boundaries for myself with him that I admittedly struggle to keep end of email. Yeah, could absolutely be dependent personality disorder. He sees himself as a child. He's easily taken advantage of. He doesn't have boundaries. He tends to create a vacuum where other people are sucked in to wanting to save him. Um, And when he's not in a relationship, he doesn't take care of himself. He doesn't do what he needs to do. And, And when he's in a relationship, then they will take care of him and tell him what to do. So it's very classic dependency. And what should you do? Well, you know, keep recommending therapy, but you can't force people to go. It's hard. Now, the plus side is that dependent personality disorder folks tend to take to therapy pretty well, which makes sense, right? Because they often are reaching out for help and are very much um, needy of help. And so they will uh, take to therapy pretty well, as opposed to someone with narcissism, which is harder to get them to go. Um, Also, I would recommend keeping up the boundaries and avoiding getting sucked in to saving them. It doesn't usually help in the long run because it keeps them in this idea that they can't do things on their own. Uh, One of the things you can do as a, a, you know, a family member is as a sibling is believe in them and show it. You can help them, but don't save them in a loving way, right? So the next time they come to you with this vacuum uh, you know, feeling, you know, they, they're vacuum, they're sucking you into, you know, a common thing might be um, you, they call you and they're just like, um, I, I got this letter from the IRS and I don't know what to do. And they, they have a pattern. They just exhibit this complete incompetence. And so you're, since you are commonly, since you love your brother, then you're like, oh, okay, well, I better go over there. I better read the letter. I better figure out what to do. Well, instead of you know, rushing in and saving them, 
you help them instead and believe in them. And I've worked with a lot of families in the situation, by the way, and it, it takes a long time. It doesn't work overnight. It might not even work at all, but this is generally the approach you have to dependent uh, family members. You say to them, so in this example, you say, okay, I'll come over. You go over and you look at the letter and you say, well, I don't know if I know anything more than you would about this. I mean, you're a smart person. Uh, I think I would just Google it or I would call them and just figure it out. Uh, but, you know, you're a smart person. You, I'm sure you can do it. And, um, you know, if you need any help with that, uh, I'll be here. How about, how about you call the IRS right now and I'll just be here if you need any help? Uh, so you, you understand that approach that I'm having. Like I'm believing I'm there. I'm not just rejecting him, like figure it out on your own, but I'm also not doing it for them. If you do it for them, that shows them that you think that they can't do it on their own. And it reinforces the idea that they can't do it on their own. So uh, the idea is, is that the individual, the dependent person wants to feel competent. They want to feel like they can do things on their own, but they don't ever have a chance to uh, try it out because one, as they were growing up, they had overprotective parents or something. And two, as an adult, they default to always sucking other people in to save them. And so they've never been given a chance to try things uh, and, and find out that they can do things on their own. Anyway, having said that, I've worked with a lot of clients in your position and seen zero results from your approach. So don't expect the approach that I'm saying to work because a lot of other things have to happen other than your boundary making with your family member. They need to go to therapy. They need to heal from their traumas that led to dependency to begin with. They have to spend years and years and years building independent personality traits, which have been neglected since they were basically born. So it takes a long time. All right. This next email is from anonymous patron. They write, I've had a boyfriend who I believe suffers from dependent personality disorder based on your deep dive. He falls under the categories of separation anxiety dependent, and mesh dependent, and life avoidant dependent. However, I don't particularly think it's something that has been prevalent since his childhood. Rather, it seemed to have formed during his adolescence in response to unresolved traumatic events in his childhood. Is this a possibility or does dependent personality disorder only manifest during childhood? To elaborate, his parents had a very messy divorce when he was in middle school. His father cheated on his best friend's mother, and his high school girlfriend cheated on him with his best friend. Right after this occurred, he so let me so let's see. His father cheated with his best friend's mother, and his girlfriend cheated on him with his best friend. So it's like this one family was very invasive of his family. Anyway, right after these occurred, he grew attached to a girl he met overseas who helped him cope with the aftermath and has been extremely emotion, emotionally dependent on her ever since. He doesn't necessarily need to go to her to, for advice, but just needs to be around her and talk to her daily. If he goes through periods of time without contacting her, he grows extremely depressed and even suicidal. As a result, he claims to feel permanently broken and will never be emotionally ready for a relationship. I have contemplated the cause of this severe attachment for a while, and while I'm sure it's a culmination of a lot of aspects, I can't help but think that maybe it has developed into dependent personality disorder. End of email. Yeah, it's hard to say. It could be dependent personality disorder, but he would need to have the deep schema that he feels he's incompetent and can't do things on his own and needs other people to do things for him, which I'm not hearing. I mean, you, you actually said he doesn't necessarily, necessarily need the person to go to for advice, but he does talk with her uh, very often. And when he isn't around her and goes through periods of time where he can't contact her, he grows extremely depressed and even suicidal. So on one hand, you could describe it generally as he is overly dependent on this individual, but we wouldn't say that he is generally dependent on, on everyone, on someone, right? Uh, so I'm not hearing the kind of core issue to dependent personality disorder. Is something going wrong here? Does he need help? Sounds like it. The hypothesis that I would pursue if I were treating him would be complicated grief 
when you go through huge losses that are complicated, we sometimes will have a complicated uh, path with our own grief. So he had his parents were divorced. And although that can cause complications just by itself, it was further complicated by the fact that his father cheated on uh, cheated with his best friend's mother. So that would complicate things. Um, even just a father cheating and that re- that leading to divorce can can be very complicated because you think, oh, if it wasn't for that that other woman, or why did my dad hurt my mom that way? Why you know? And instead of the more, I don't know, quote unquote, healthy way that divorce happens where parents just, they don't fight in the open and they go to the kids and say, you know what, we're really sorry, but we are, um, we've grown it out of love and we don't want to live with each other anymore. Um, we still love each other. We're just not in love with each other. And that can be traumatic too for a kid, but it lends itself to or towards a less complicated grief process. And then of course, his high school girlfriend cheated on him. So he has this understandable fear of being abandoned as developed by his, you know, adolescent years. But does he have a personality disorder? Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, I'm not hearing evidence of that. It could be, but again, I would guess that he has separation anxiety or a, a, a again, I wouldn't call it separation anxiety. I would call it complicated. The, the category I'd put it in is complicated grief where he has these complications from the grief meaning that it's hard for him to resolve those events that happened. And he is hypervigilant. You could even say he's like mildly traumatized. And he, he's hypervigilant around keeping people close because he's had so many people suddenly leave him and betray him. And so he has reasons to be very clingy and also very uh, you know, depressed and anxious when he doesn't have strong evidence that someone's going to be there for him. Um, and he is demoralized easily, you know, that kind of thing. So again, I don't know, and I can't diagnose from afar, obviously, but uh, those are my thoughts on that. All right, this next email is from patron Danny from Boston. She writes, I'm in graduate school for clinical mental health counseling, and I wonder how risky it is to have an OnlyFans account selling nude pictures of myself. I am coming from an art undergrad program and have a lot of body positive and nude art even on my Instagram, and show my body freely on the internet. I think it's important to have a role model that represents overweight bodies that are sexual beings. Do you think having an OnlyFans account is going to prevent me from getting my license in mental health counseling? End of email. Uh, So it's not likely to, it's extremely unlikely to prevent you from getting your license. But there's a possibility because usually state governments don't look at, they don't usually Google you. Um, so if you meet all the criteria for getting your license to practice in your state, then in all likelihood you will get your license uh, because again, the state doesn't, doesn't investigate you. The state government will rely on complaints to um, look into things. And so the issue would come up likely is if a, either client or even just someone in the public who knew you were a therapist uh, complained about you to your state licensing board. And then this question would come up as to whether or not it was an ethical violation or if harm to a client occurred. And we would look at the topic of dual or multiple relationships because you not only have a relationship with the client as a client, but now you have potentially a relationship with the client as a performer, a nude performer on the internet. Now it's a similar issue to me. I have a podcast and some of my clients over the years have listened to my podcast and thus I have a multiple relationship with those clients. Those clients see me as their therapist and as their podcaster. And so uh, I created that and I am responsible for managing the risk of that multiple relationship. There are risks like with nude pictures, a client could see those pictures and begin to sexualize you, which would be somewhat understandable for some folks. And that would interfere with the client's ability to benefit from your treatment. Or 
a client could see the pictures and feel ashamed of their own body or, you know, who knows it, it, the sky's the limit. Lots of people have various different reactions. It's not likely to happen. Um, but, uh, uh, lots of people have I- internet presence, have an internet presence, including myself. Uh, some people have podcasts, some people have Instagram accounts that are very popular. Some people have nude pictures. Some people are sex workers and are therapists. So there's nothing, in, there's nothing inherently unethical or um, uh, against the law around uh, those kinds of, well, I don't know, it depends on where you're at with regards to the law. But as long as you're following the law, which it sounds like you are, then there's, yeah, it, it's generally considered fine. Now, will you find a lot of therapists uh, blinking their eyes at you and wondering and accusing you of being um, unethical. Yeah, I, I would venture to say most therapists and most people in our society would consider a nude performer on the internet to be inherently unethical if they were to become a therapist. But that's just not true. Ethics experts, spe- specifically in sexuality, would not agree with that. So just because our culture or even the majority of therapists would lean a certain way, that doesn't mean that it's right headed. But it does mean you're more likely to get complaints and you would just have to hope that the state licensing board would understand the, uh, you know, cutting edge ethical considerations when, or, you know, approach to this sort of thing. So uh, now what do you do? Well, you work with a supervisor because you're just graduating. And so you want to have a supervisor that knows how to work with this sort of thing. They don't have to know specifically only fans or specifically nude pictures, but they do need to understand how to manage dual relationship with dual relationships with clients and internet presence. Uh, it is a growing area of supervision competence, but it is small. Not most, most people on our field have really no idea how to use the internet. They're afraid of it in my experience. Um, hence the fact that there are, you know, thousands and thousands of therapists and how many therapists have a podcast and how many of them have a YouTube channel. It's like very, very infrequent. And it, our profession really lends itself to being on the internet because everyone has a brain. <laughs> everyone is in a relationship and yet hardly any of us are on the internet. And you just have all these people spreading misinformation and, you know, we got to step up. But anyway, um, so if you're one of those people, you're thinking about it, you know, go for it. <laughs> we need scientific evidence-based voices, uh, educated voices in where people go, which is on the internet. Anyway, so you need to find a supervisor that understands it. And then you work on your disclosure statement so that clients have a chance to read, you, you know, there's various different approaches. You could, uh, the most responsible approach is literally in your disclosure statement that you give to all your clients. It says, I am a nude performer on the internet and uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you just say, I just want you to know if you ever want to talk about it, you can talk about it with me. But the reason why I do this is because I am trying to uh, spread the word that um, body positivity is okay, that having overweight bodies, uh, you know, normalized is very important to me. And people enjoy it and art is art and everything's fine and there's no shame in that. So there would be some kind of disclosure statement that you would say. You might also benefit by actually talking with your clients in the beginning of therapy about it. It doesn't have to be done in the first session, but maybe in the first few sessions. It's best if it's done in the first session at the beginning. You say, by the way, I have this internet presence. And you might even tell your clients, look, for therapy to work well, I recommend you don't look it up because it could interfere with things. But you're, of course, free to do that. And the reason why I bring this up is because if you just Google my name, you'll come across it. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is your OnlyFans account and all your internet presence could be under a different name. And then when your clients Google you, they won't find that information, right? Um, the other thing you can do is you can only see clients that are likely to be okay with it and, and maybe try to screen out clients that this might become a problem. And how do we detect that? Well, you know, it's subtle, but I would talk with your supervisor about that. The other thing that would really solve a lot of it is to make your pictures harder to access. Um, it, you know, from what I understand, OnlyFans is, is like Patreon um, and 
so you can just put everything behind a paywall and then your clients are just a little bit less likely to have access to that. Um, but it sounds like that you're not really interested in that because you want to be more, you know, uh, you want to advocate, you want your, you don't want your, you don't want all your stuff to be behind a paywall. So yeah, there's a way to do it and you need to find a supervisor that can help you. I would look up all the literature on multiple relationships and proper disclosures and minimizing potential risk of harm to clients with these kinds of things. And uh, yeah, you can actually listen to my whole episode on, I think it's called something like therapists using social media, the ethics of therapists using social media, something like that. And it applies to you because uh, even, you know, even though I'm just doing a podcast and you're doing nude photos, the principles are the same. Okay, let's take a break and get back. We will answer more patron emails. Hey, Deserving Listeners. As you all know, I am constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. Well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy, and you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today. All right, we're back from the break. I want to do an OPP for our old patrons from November of 2016. So I want to give a shout out to these individuals who became a patron almost five years ago and have stuck with us this entire time. We have Anna from Atlanta. We have Tanya from Massachusetts. We have Drew from Decatur, Illinois. We have Adam from Clinton, Maryland. We have Brooke from Fig Tree, New South Wales in Australia. We have Robert from Wisconsin and we have Megan from Melbourne. Thank you so much, Anna, Tanya, Drew, Adam, Brooke, Robert, and Megan for being a patron, one, and being a patron for so long. It's just really wonderful. When I first started to look up this info on Patreon not too long ago, I'm like, I wonder if there's any anyone who's been with us this whole time. And I was actually pleasantly surprised to see that a lot of people have have been with us this entire time, which is really, really great. Um, and I think I know, I think I've communicated with you, Brooke, and you, Robert, maybe a few of the others as well. Uh, reach out to me and let me know <laughs> if you're one of those people. But anyway, let's go on to some emails. All right, six emails from Anonymous Patron. They write, if I feel unable to resist my urge to masturbate and or have sex, even at times where it would negatively impact my work and my daily life, does that mean I have a sex addiction? end of email. Well, it's one of the signs and the word addiction is actually um, used in a lot of different contexts. But generally speaking, when we're talking about any addiction, whether it's sex or otherwise, we're talking about the following experiences <clears throat> where you have obsessive thoughts about the thing, whether it's alcohol or sex or gambling, you have a compulsive urge to engage in those activities whether it be sex, alcohol, heroin, cigarettes, whatever. Like it's this uncontrollable or itch where you just like, you, you feel this building pressure and it's all you can think about, right? Efforts to cut back, but not being able to, that's a sign of addiction. Shame about the inability to control it. Hiding it from others, that's a sign and negative consequences, this is really key. You need you need to have, so one of the things that I like to delineate is like someone will say like, oh, I masturbate five times a day. Does that mean I'm a sex addict? And I'm like, well, is it a problem for you? Because for some people, although 
culturally speaking, masturbating five times a day is considered to be a sex addict. That is not the definition of sex addiction. Uh, and we certainly have a sex negative uh, society that will label that as disgusting, even if you you know masturbate every day or masturbate at all, they'll say there's something wrong with you. So the analogy or the parallel behavior I'll say is, say that you like to read a book five times a day, or you like to go for a walk five times a day, or you like to play fetch with your dog five times a day. These are all just things that people like to do. But why do we pathologize masturbation five times a day, but taking your dog for a walk five times a day is not pathologized? Now, can either one of those behaviors become an addiction? Yes. It's not likely that walking your dog could become an, an addiction, meaning that it would cause, that it would have obsessive compulsive aspects to it, that you would have negative consequences. Um, but uh, anyway, so we have to be careful about imposing societal norms on behaviors and just labeling it as an addiction. So we need to have negative consequences that need to come from uh, reasonable sources. So another thing that I'll say about masturbation is, say you just like to masturbate a, a few times a day, and you are a teenager, and your parents are very shaming about masturbation, and they catch you masturbating and ground you. Well, so by definition, we would say, well, your masturbation practices led to a consequence because your parents are now mad at you and they've grounded you. But that's because your parents are sex negative and don't understand that it's okay to masturbate. It's not because there's something inherently wrong with your behavior. Whereas if you are a sex addict, you will tend, you will tend to be so obsessed and so compulsive about your uh, sexual activity, whether it's masturbation or otherwise, that it will destroy all your relationships. It will destroy your work. It will destroy your health. It will destroy your life. And be, because you can't think about anything else, you're not concentrating at work. You're looking up pornography while you're driving in your car and you get in a car accident. Your spouse wants to have sex with you, but you're in the other room masturbating and looking at porn. Or you are, um, you know, engaging in uh, with sex workers, even though your partner says that that's not okay or you're throwing yourself sexually at other people in a way that you wouldn't do normally because you have a sex addiction and you're putting your health at risk by STIs or being assaulted or something like that. So negative consequences have to be present in order for us to label it an addiction. And in sex addiction, there tend to be some pretty severe um, um, uh, consequences. Also, it tends to be progressive, and meaning that it gets worse over time. Uh, with any addiction, we tend to see over time it, it getting worse. Sometimes it'll kind of stay the same, but usually the consequences just start intensifying. There's also a level of denial often, a lot of justifications around it, and also that your life will revolve around that activity. So the sex addict will pretty much 90% of the time, their mind and their behaviors are at least partially, if not fully, oriented around their addiction. In the same way that if you're a, a cocaine addict and using throughout the day, your life really revolves around that activity. You could apply this to cigarettes, you could apply it to alcohol, you could apply it to caffeine. Uh, but with caffeine, uh, there's typically fewer negative consequences, right? So. Although you might, and, and this is what we're, what I'm talking about is what people sometimes refer to as like a behavioral addiction or the behavioral side or the psychological side of addiction. And then of course we have what sometimes people refer to as the physical side of addiction, meaning your tolerance level and your, the body's need to engage in that behavior, or there will be physical consequences if you don't engage, you know, withdrawal symptoms uh, with caffeine or heroin or, ca or uh, cocaine or cigarettes. Um, nicotine, when you take the substance out of your body, when you are used to having it, then you have negative consequences. But what I'm talking about is the overall word. And this is why addiction, the word has a lot of problems because people don't really know what they're talking about. And, or they have, there's a lot of different definitions. And actually when we use diagnostic labels, we don't use the word addiction. We use substance abuse disorders, these kinds of things, because I think the word addiction has, has been so loaded over the years. But anyway, so 
you ask, you know, you have, you, you have an, you're unable to resist your urge to masturbate. So that is a, that's the compulsive urge that we talked about, um, or have sex. And, uh, even at times when it would negatively impact your work or your daily life. So yeah, that's pretty, uh, quintessential addiction of any sort, whether it's sex or otherwise. Now I will say, as I often will, when this subject comes up, that the word sex addiction in our culture has become utilized in this very haphazard way where Tiger Woods, for example, will be caught cheating and he will claim that he's a sex addict or Bill Clinton or these other people. And it's possible that they actually suffer from sex addiction, but it's also possible that they're, they just cheat. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why people cheat. And why would someone that's cheating say they have a sex addiction? Well, it's because they are trying to deflect blame to some extent. It's like, well, this wasn't really my choice. I, I have this psychological disorder that causes me to cheat, which is true for some people. They absolutely do. It doesn't justify or excuse their behavior, of course. Any addictive behavior, we don't just say, well, you have an addiction, so all bets are off. Uh, but it does... A, you know, lessen the blaming aspect that you'll get from society. So that's why a lot of these public figures will claim sex addiction. A another thing that uh, will be another way that people will use the term sex addiction wrongheadedly is they will just look at someone and say, wow, that, you know, they'll look at someone that essentially just has a high libido and they'll say they're a sex addict. You know, like you'll have a high libido partner and a low libido partner in a marriage and the low libido partner is just like, I think, I think he's a sex addict when it's just a high libido, it, 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 you know, sex addiction, again, when you roll through all the things, obsessive thoughts, unable to stop, compulsive urges, trying to cut back, can't come back, shame, hiding, negative consequences. It gets work, worse over time, denial, justifying it. Your life revol all your entire life revolves around sex. Now, where's the line between someone that is just highly oriented towards sex and someone who has a sex addiction. Well, you know, it's hard to say, right? There are some weird zones there. Like you, you could, you could have a spouse, for example, that thinks about sex, you know, 50% of the day. And to you, that's excessive. And there are negative consequences because you have conflict in your relationship. And your partner sometimes will uh, go to work late because he or she or they want to have sex in the morning before they go to work. And, and so it's, it's impacting their work. And uh, so you might look at that person and be like, is that person a sex addict? No, yeah, hard to know. Uh, because is the, you know, would the, per if the person was with another person with that high of, of libido, would they have, would both of those individuals have all their needs met and only have like really minor negative consequences from that, you know? So it, it just kind of depends is the thing, <laughs> but I've treated people with sex addiction and it is when I've seen it in its quintessential form, it is unmistakable. Uh, sex addiction, when you see it, it's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> like, I remember the first person that I treated with sex addiction. I was like, oh, I see. Sex addiction is way beyond what people kind of commonly think of it, cheat, like cheating on your partner. And that's the only symptom you have is not enough for a label of sex addiction for experts. The kind of sex addiction behaviors that I would see would be literally 24 seven obsession, compulsive about, you know, obsessed and compulsive about sexuality, where they're trying to work at their computer and they just have this nagging voice in their head, just like, look at porn, look at porn, look at porn. And this is, this spans all genders. Uh, this, these are people not, you know, in your head, you're just thinking, oh, they're all men. No, I, I've treated women who suffer from sex addiction and had really big consequences. So it, it's definitely not just a male thing. I, I'm guessing the prevalence is a little higher for men, but plenty of women suffer from sex addiction. Absolutely. Uh, so there's this constant voice of just like, look at porn, look at porn. Or I got to get home so I can, and then when they do, if they, if it does manifest in masturbation, they will masturbate until they're, until they're bleeding. Um, and, and they don't want to do it. You know, it's sort of like if you are addicted to cigarettes, a lot of people will say, well, I, I enjoy some of the smoking, but a lot of the cigarettes that I smoke, I'm doing because I, I just have to. And that's what 
sex addicts will talk about. They'll talk about how, well, yeah, I, lo- I like to masturbate, but a lot of times I'm masturbating because I just feel like I have to. It's just this compulsion. I feel like I can't move on with my day until I do it. It's like a chore that I have to do. And so you'll hear that language or you'll you'll see someone perusing the uh, the internet looking for a sex worker or they're perusing the city that they live in looking for a sex worker and they're doing it uh, 10 hours in a row uh, instead of a typical sex work customer will find a sex worker and and have sex <laughs> um, but the sex addicted person will the, the, they're addicted to the whole process, if that makes any sense. The, the, the shopping, the looking, the thinking, the imagining, and it's hours upon hours and hours. And they might do it all night long and not sleep. Or um, what's another kind of presentation? Well, I don't know. Those are, the, those are the common ones. All right. This next email is from patron Marquita. She writes in, is there a such thing as covert incest? Is there such a thing as covert incest? A person on TikTok described her childhood trauma as covert incest. Have you heard of this? She describes being treated like the parent's therapist, being made to feel responsible for the parent's happiness. Wouldn't this just be called enmeshment? End of email. Yeah, so covert incest is a term that we don't, I don't really, I don't use very often, but... Some people do. <clears throat> there are other terms, which, which I'll get into in a second. But the definition, according to, uh, there's various different def- definitions, but American Psychological Association on their website uh, defines it as a form of emotional abuse in which a parent turns to his or her child as a surrogate partner, seeking from the child the emotional support that would more appropriately be provided by the person's spouse or another adult. End of definition. Right. So... Um, in my family therapy world, my in my family of origin class, I, I actually talk about this role. Um, in my class, I label it as the marital role, meaning that as a child, you are made to feel as though you are essentially married to your one of your parents, and it is a type of enmeshment uh, role. This is different from being parentified or companionate. So... If you're parentified as a child, then you're made to either take care of your younger siblings or you're made to take care of your parents. So you are, as a child, parenting your siblings or you're parenting your parents. We also have the companionate role, and this is more of a friend enmeshment role in which you are your parent's best friend. But with the marital role, you are your parents' surrogate spouse. And that does happen. And uh, uh, on the, you know, what you're seeing on TikTok is this person describing covert incest. And yeah, that that's, they're all the same. Marital role, covert incest, it's all uh, uh, different types of enmeshment. The word incest, I think, is a bit extreme. Uh, when I think, when I, especially covert incest, when I hear that term, what it sounds like to me is that sexual incest is occurring and it is subtle. Maybe the victim doesn't even necessarily know that the sexual act is occurring or it's more subtle, you know, like, uh, well, I won't go into graphic details, but you could imagine a uh, parent having sex with a child and with their own child and hiding the fact that it is sexual, if that makes any sense. Anyway. So covert incest, I think, goes a little far. It makes so much more sense just to call it a marital role or a spousal role for a child. It, I don't think there's much ambiguity when we use that term, and, it, and it's, it's, it won't be misunderstood. But, you know, covert incest is a term that some authors will, will use. Now, why do some parents do this? Well, it's because they have needs. We all have needs, right? And if we feel like or we actually can't get those needs met through one vector, then we will look to other vectors to get those needs met, especially if we have some sort of personality issue or attachment issue or modeling issue. If we were a marital role or a spousal role for one of our parents, 
then that opens the door for that be- to become normalized and is your template for love. And thus, when you have your own kids, then you're more likely to engage in what people call covert incest. But in your description, Marquita, you're saying that on TikTok, the person describes that uh, they were being treated like the parent's therapist and being made to feel responsible for the parent's happiness. This is not actually covert incest. What that is, is parentification or just general enmeshment. Uh, In order for it to be covert incest, it has to be, uh, the child has to feel as though they are romantically involved with the parents. And again, it's not, it's usually not uh, super overt. Like a common example that I teach about, it's it's, uh, an example from a play that I have my students read. And in that play, the mother uh, and the, the grown son who is, you know, 35 years old or something, he's talking about when he was growing up, he often felt responsible and he was made to feel responsible for the marriage, for his, for his mother's happiness when his father would disappoint his mother. So he's a kid and he's watching his father neglect and disappoint his mother and he both feels he wants to please his mom so that she can feel better. And he sort of is forced into it by the family system. And on one hand, he kind of likes being close to his mom. On the other hand, he doesn't feel like it's fair for him as a seven-year-old or a 12-year-old to be responsible for the mother's romantic needs. And so the behaviors that he talks about in the play is that he would, at a event, he might dance with his mother uh, during a slow song so that she feels that she has at least some spousal attention where the father should have been the one dancing with his wife, but instead the son is the one dancing with his mother. And it feels romantically tinted to both the mother and the child, but it's not actual sexual, it's not sexualized. Um, But on TikTok, what we're hearing is that the individual is treated like the parent's therapist. And that again, sounds more like parentification and then responsible for the parent's happiness. And that's just generally true about enmeshment. All right, this next email is from an anonymous patron. She writes, recently in therapy, I have come to understand that I might be a little evil. Like some of the characteristics of psychopathy and sadism resonate with me. As a student of somatic psychology and a systems thinker, I know this part of me is largely driven by the traumas I have experienced growing up and witnessing a level of psychopathy in my own home between my parents. It is hard hard knowing how to navigate this part of me, although it is relieving to not keep it in the dark. Do you think if I pay attention to it, it will grow? If so, how do you balance accepting gnarly parts of yourself and potential fascination with the darkness while not letting them get the best of you? This feels very scary to be asking about, but I really value your compassionate perspective on all things. End of email. Yeah, so good awareness. It's good that you are aware of this sort of thing. You're talking about psychopathy and sadism. I'm guessing that you are uh, feeling as though you don't have the average level of empathy for others. You don't necessarily care about other people's feelings. And you also talk about sadism, which is a pleasure in harming others and or seeing others be harmed. And although many people won't be able to relate to you, some people can. And you're asking if I pay attention to these feelings, will they grow? Well, hard. it's hard to know. And it really depends, uh, in my opinion, on what you do with it. There's nothing wrong with having feelings. There's nothing wrong with being attracted to something or having a lack of empathy. It just depends on what you do with it. And the key is, you know, so you, you, you phrase it, you know, how do I balance accepting this part of myself without letting them get the best of me? And that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I would focus more on how do I accept these parts of myself while not being immoral, while not harming others in reality, while not doing things that are, uncon- you know, that lack consent. And so the key is, is that you get consent before engaging in satisfying your sadistic needs, maybe fantasy or channeling. So for example, you can engage in consensual BDSM sexual activities. It, it's unclear if that would work for you, but that can be an outlet. 
video games can have aspects of you know, violence and sadism in it. And you know, it's just a harmless video game. The key is, again, is continue talking with your therapist to monitor your feelings such that they don't seem to be growing in a way that would uh, result in actually harming another human being. Art, movies, books, uh, talking about it with other people that are like you uh, might be helpful, but it, it's, it depends. You really just have to monitor it as you go. And plenty of people have sadistic and psychopathic tendencies and know about it and don't act on those in a way that would harm others. And that's the key is you say, you know, how do I not let them get the best of me? Well, I, what I would focus on is how do I not let them get the best of others? How do I have these qualities? And because okay, the, the, the flip side is potentially true as well. If you stuff the feelings and, and deny them, then it's quite possible that they would intensify, intensify and come out in ways that actually would be out of your control and harm other people. So continue talking about it. Find ways to satisfy your sadistic needs in a way that doesn't actually harm other people. And continue, you know, just continue monitoring. All right, this next email is from patron Roshin. She writes, why is it important for us to use trigger warnings? I am a dance movement therapist in Wales. I was listening to a podcast on eating disorders, and one of the speakers spoke about trigger warnings and how they've gotten out of hand as we use trigger warnings for everything now. In short, the speaker posited that we need to be exposed to our triggers and not to avoid them, and that this would help with our healing. I would be really interested to hear your thoughts on this. End of email. Yeah, so the term trigger warning has been overused in the last 10 years. I actually did an episode on this a number of years ago, maybe six years ago. You can listen to the archive on our website and go to the episode ep- you know, the episode list page, and we have all the episodes categorized as well. I'm guessing it's under like maybe the disorders um, page, but it was first developed, the term trigger warning, to help people with mental or psychological symptoms that can be triggered. Like if you suffer from PTSD, like you're sexually assaulted, you were sexually assaulted and you suffer from PTSD as a result of that assault, then if you're in a classroom and you're watching a movie that it depicts a sexual assault, like um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, there's a, I believe there's a sexual assault scene in that movie, and you didn't know that that scene was coming and you're stuck watching this scene, there's a chance, not automatic, that your PTSD would be triggered by that scene and you would have a massive spike in distress and might be thrown into symptoms for the next month just because someone didn't say, by the way, in this movie, there is a depiction of a sexual assault trigger warning. The trigger warning is designed to help people who are hopefully aware, but not everyone is aware, but hopefully people are aware. So you say, trigger warning, this movie just, you know, depicts a sexual assault in a graphic nature. And so those people, again, who hopefully know that they have PTSD, if they have that proper treatment, will be able to opt out of watching it. They'll stand up and walk out or they won't show up to begin with. And that's the best trigger warnings to provide is well before the event so that people can just not show up. If you tell people just before the scene, some people might feel socially pressured not to leave, and that is not a proper trigger warning. There's also, uh, people can be triggered for non-suicidal self-injury, like cutting. There can be eating disorder triggers if someone is in recovery for eating disorders and there's a depiction of bulimia or of restricting or even anything regarding food this can actually trigger people and their symptoms of their eating disorders. Suicidal ideation can, and suicidal attempts can be triggered by depictions of suicide or discussions of suicide. So trigger warnings are very important. They literally can save people's lives or greatly improve it because people have legitimate reasons and legitimate triggers that can be triggered and thus they should be warned. However, the term trigger warning has been co-opted by people who simply just don't like someone else's opinion. And that is not okay. We can certainly have another term for that. 
And if someone doesn't want to hear someone's political opinion or some other opinion, then they have every right to speak up for themselves and to say, I don't want to hear that on my campus, or I don't want to sit in this uh, meeting and deal with that. For sure, if you want to advocate for yourself, then go for it. But to use the word trigger warning is co-opting something that is much needed and is very sensitive to dilution, and we need to stop doing that. Now, the issue of sh- that people need to be exposed, you were listening to a podcast that if, about eating disorders, and they're like, oh, you know, everything's a trigger warning to everyone, and, and we need to be exposed to our triggers. This is rhetoric that is ridiculous. Um, and now, I don't know if it's based on the co-opting term of trigger warning, but if we're going to use the original term, the original definition of trigger warning, you do not, uh, if someone is suffering from PTSD... They need to be on a very careful regimen of exposure, and then they will heal. But that needs to be under very controlled circumstances where the individual with trauma has control over the, over the, intensive, uh, the intensity of the distress, and they're being monitored by a therapist. Uh, the idea that someone who suffers from PTSD as a result of sexual trauma, uh, that they're being a wimp by opting out of a, of watching a movie in which there's sexual assault completely is wrongheaded and, and extremely harmful to, to, to be talking about. And that includes eating disorders as well. This idea that people are just being uh, whiny babies and wimps with their eating disorder and they need to sit through triggering in order to cope with, in order to heal from their eating disorder uh, is ridiculous. Now, does some exposure need to occur? Yes, but it needs to be done under controlled circumstances. In those situations, there is no need for trigger warnings because when I treat people with PTSD or eating disorders or suicidal ideation or non-suicidal self-injury or other things that can be triggered, we have very lengthy discuss- discussions about uh, their triggers and how we can monitor that as we go. I, I never use the word trigger warning because we are literally talking about their triggers throughout therapy. So this idea that uh, people need to be exposed to things is one, a total misunderstanding of trauma and the other issues that I talk about. Two is mental illness shaming. And three is just, I don't know, I, I don't, I, this sort of rhetoric of like, people need to grow up. You know, you, you'll just hear this thing like, uh, just get over yourself. You're, you, have, you have a victim mentality, you know, these kinds of attacks. And and I find them to just completely misunderstand what what humans are really like. <laughs> now, uh, uh, now, is it kind of true when we talk about some people who might use the word trigger warning and be too, sen- you know, I don't know if this person is very common, but we might imagine someone who is extremely... Uh, they just really dislike a particular political point of view. So the, this person is uh, politically minded and they don't like uh, people with opposing political views. And they will say, you know, I'm being triggered by someone else's different opinion about how to allocate funds for our national budget. But they're not actually being triggered in the you know, mental health sense. They're just, they just don't like it, but they're co-opting the term trigger as a way of trying to gain justification or trying to make a point or something. And does that person, you know, would that person benefit perhaps from being exposed to differing political views such that it doesn't throw them off a cliff emotion wise uh, to, to be able to hear other people's opinions is important if you're going to engage in political discourse. Uh, is Does that person, quote unquote, need to be exposed? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But uh, when it comes to PTSD, NSSI, ED, suicide, these things are legit and definitely require trigger warnings. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself, take care of others, provide trigger warnings, and ask for them because you deserve it. You really, really do.